On April 6, 1992, Microsoft released Windows 3.1, which managed to sell 1 million copies in just two months, a new record both for tech giant and industry itself. It was also a year when first reusable alkaline battery was introduced for commercial use, and it may not seem like much now, but modern rechargeable batteries that we use in most of our portable tech share a bit of a past with this technology. IBM introduced ThinkPad, the first notebook featuring a 10.4 inch color TFT screen that while groundbreaking at the time would be largely useless today, with terrible refresh rate, awful dusting and generally bland looking image. Such were the times I suppose. Intel released the 486DX2 CPU, effectively doubling the frequency at which originally operated. And last but definitely not least, on December 3rd, 1992, the very first ever SMS text message was sent, and funny enough, not from a phone but PC. But the recipient was a cellular phone, so it counts, right? And it's as good time as any to ask you to do that clickety click clack thing on those like and subscribes and share buttons below, it really helps a lot. And if you're feeling extra generous, you can consider joining my Patreon and help me make the channel even better. But you do you. All content here will always be free, just released a day or so later than on Patreon. Early 90s were an interesting time to be alive. World was changing faster than ever, with new technologies releasing seemingly daily. And gaming was no different, hardware came and often disappeared as soon as it surfaced. Companies emerged and went bankrupt, and that constant change could practically be felt in the air. It had a scent, a smell of progress, that was so fast that often what was considered new and groundbreaking a day or two later became obsolete. Keeping up with all that was not easy, but it was a hell of a ride. And while it could be argued that with each decade change became faster and faster, and frankly I don't disagree, 90s were the tipping point, where it all began and snowballing of creativity and innovation started. But you don't care about that. You're not here to listen to me babble about the times where we went from listening to buzzing modem sounds to ultra-fast cable connections, or from even minutes long up and game loading to them launching in mere seconds. No, you wanna know what gaming was like in 1992. So, let's have a look. Airbags is light business simulation striving to capture the underlying workings of an airline industry. The game is not overly deep on the simulation aspects, however, trying to be more on the lighter side. Focusing more on optimization and upgrades like arranging the amounts of seats per plane, deciding on quality of in-flight food and entertainment and such. Other than that, you'll be also designing global routes, paying for landing rights to unlock new airport destinations and setting up prices for fares. The game can be played either by up to four players or with three CPU controlled opponents. While it may not be as in-depth as some other latest simulations were, it's an enjoyable title and I never felt like I was wasting time playing it. Ultima 7 Part 1 The Black Gate is a vast and captivating role-playing, and a follow-up to the long-running series by now legendary Richard Garion. It is also a first, or one of the first, in many things design-wise. It's the first Ultima using top-down worldview that fills up the entire screen. It's also a first to introduce such a deep and true-to-life NPC scheduling, meaning their lives are fully planned out, simulating real life. They go to work, after, they visit tavern for a drink or two, and finally go back home to bed. It may not seem like much, but back then, when NPCs in most games just stood around in one spot for days on end, this made you feel as if you were part of a larger living world that kept going whether you were there to witness it or not. Additionally, it was the first title in the series to introduce full mouse-driven drag-and-drop on all objects in the game and real-time combat, where unlike in previous games you only control the main hero, Avatar, and the rest of your companions act on their own. And last but not least, it's a first title that was not only split into parts, but each had a separate add-on expansion. Interesting fact, if Avatar and his companions don't eat regularly in Ultima 7, they will die. Oregon Trail Deluxe is arguably the richest and most advanced out of all classic Oregon Trail games. In its essence, it's an educational title created to depict the struggles of a group of settlers going from independence misery to Williamette Valley in Oregon via covered wagon in 1848. Over the years, the game became infamous for its unforgiving difficulty with in-game characters' deaths to dysentery even becoming part of a modern pop culture, appearing on t-shirts, in TV shows and movies. Oregon Trail, in any of its versions, was largely popularized by the fact that it seemed to be available in all schools in the US, and many of now adults grew up playing it then and there. What you'll do in a game, in short, is pick your initial travel supplies, hunt for food on your way, resupply at forts, manage your inventory as it's limited in size, and peak speed of traversal, keeping in mind weather conditions and health of your group members. 
It's a simple game in its design, but underlying mechanics and struggles settlers face make it surprisingly difficult and by extension of that an unforgettable experience. If there ever was a clear step up in quality of everything in game design in a follow-up to acclaimed title, Lynx 386 Pro was just that. It features Harbortown Golf Lynx course and a whole bunch of 17 additional purchasable courses. The golfing engine is as good as it's always been and is still a pleasure to play, being easy to get into and tough to master. But the presentation was what received a huge facelift. Nice the graphics That's are photorealistic in high-res, high-color SVGA mode. Physics have been revamped from ground up to offer as realistic ball behavior as possible and links could finally be played with either male or female avatars. Sound effects have also been lifted and in general the game felt like an appropriate step up from already great earlier years title. This however did not came free. The game required a 386 CPU, 2MB of RAM and SVGA graphics card with at least 512KB of memory on board. And all that was just a bare minimum to run it. More RAM and better CPU definitely improved the experience. Wizardry 7 Crusaders of the Dark Savant is a direct sequel to Wizardry 6 Bane of the Cosmic Forge that we spoke about in an earlier video, and a first person role playing game. Right after finding the Cosmic Forge, just as it's being taken away from them by the servant of the Cosmic Lords, Cyborg Altidis, our heroes realize that it's actually a clue to a location of the Astral Domina, the artifact of life hidden somewhere on the planet Guardia. So, you must travel there and find it. And while on Guardia, you'll obviously have tons of adventures. This time, however, you're not limited to dungeons and can explore towns and vast forested areas between them too. NPCs have their own agendas and life schedules, so they may move around and can even hunt down objects in-game if you're not quick enough to find them first. Few extra skills not present in aerial games have been added, most important of them diplomacy, highlighting a much more important role of dialogues in this outing. Wizardry 7 is also first of the bunch to offer auto-mapping and skill increase with the usage. It may not be the best RPG out there, but it's a very good one and a definite culmination of a whole series of games. Waxworks is a role-playing dungeon-crawling adventure horror, a mix unlike many. Developers didn't try to hide the fact that the game was inspired by 1988's movie Waxwork and coincidentally was their last game before they changed the name into Adventuresoft and moved on to more light-hearted and honestly better titles like Simon the Sorcerer. The game is divided into five differently themed parts. Ancient Egypt, Medieval Transylvania, Victorian England, Industrial Mine and Iaxonas Period. And apart from the last one that always has to be completed at the very end, the other ones can be approached in any order. Three of them have combat and puzzle solving mixed more or less equally, while the Victorian England and Ayaxonas focus on puzzles in majority. Interestingly enough, progress between each stage resets, so each can be treated as individual shorter adventure. While the amount of gore and gruesome deaths can be difficult to stomach for some, the game is generally speaking quite fun. While I'm not the biggest fan myself, leaning towards more traditional RPGs, I can appreciate Waxworks' qualities. Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis is what third movie in the indie trilogy should have been. But instead we've got Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal School, which was a bit of a letdown. Still, Fate of Atlantis is arguably the most ambitious and biggest in scope out of all LucasArts adventure games that came out today. The While the puzzles the are quite tough in this one, they are not illogical as in many other point-and-click games, so you should never really be left in a situation where you have to get into trial and error frenzy. A very unique at the time feature was the ability to complete the game in one of three different ways, aka paths that you get to follow. So you can choose the team path, the wits path and the fists path. First, we'll allow Indy to take Sophia Habgood with him on the adventure and she will provide support all throughout. Second, adds more puzzles and always presents more complex and challenging versions of them. And finally, the fist path focuses on action sequences and fist fighting, which in itself is completely optional in the first two modes. On top of that, there are also three entirely different endings, a good one and two bad ones. So Fate of Atlantis, unlike most adventure games even today, offers a lot of replayability. Star Control 2 is one of the most beloved and most important mixed genre games of the early 90s. The Earth is enslaved by the evil race of Urkan, and you're heading off to space to find allies among other races to overthrow the Urkan overlords. The game is part strategy, part role-playing, part adventure and part arcade shooter. It's everything and anything rolled up into one very enjoyable and very engaging package. The space is two-dimensional in Star Control 2 viewed from above. 
you can travel between various constellations and planets and meet different aliens, each of them having a certain and indicated on the map sphere of control around their home systems. You can deal with them either diplomatically, via dialogue or engage in more direct combat. First approach obviously is advisable in majority of cases, especially that completing quests for the other races may result in them joining your side. On your travels you'll also be upgrading your main ship, buying other smaller ones to accompany you and participate in combat, and hiring additional crew members, who funny enough work as HP points on the ships. And last but not least, you'll be scanning the planets and harvesting them for raw materials that act as money when buying things at star bases. Star Control 2 is a difficult game to describe in just a few sentences, but let the fact that it's still being remade, fixed and patched to this day, and even released for free as Urkan Masters, speak to its timeless quality. The Locomotion is a fantastic puzzle game that's also quite challenging, but not in a frustration-inducing way, more in a I know I can do better next time way. While the premise is simple, the fact that the game runs in real time makes for very adrenaline-filled puzzling. There are letter named train stations and trains are moving between them. Challenge comes from making sure that the tracks are correctly switched to get the trains to their destinations without crashing. And since they all run at once, it can become hectic easily. Even the third level poses a much bigger challenge than the first to do. As much as I don't care for trains or Twitch arcade games, there's just something about locomotion that makes me really enjoy its gameplay loop. Oog, Ag, or however you wanna call it, is not your everyday platformer. In fact, you don't walk around around platforms at all. Instead, you're a pilot picking up and delivering passengers between them. And as much as it may seem odd and boring, the gameplay is extremely addictive. There are numerous enemies and environmental obstacles, and the platform placement along with the time limits prove to be a great formula for progression. Ag is a really cool game and one that everyone should try, as it's a hidden gem among hundreds of semi-platformers of the early 90s. It can be found on many different platforms apart from DOS, but I'd say that the DOS is probably the second most playable, just after Amiga. Let me start by saying that while Dune 2 is the more popular of the two games, I consider the first Dune to be a more memorable title. It's a masterpiece that effortlessly blends the adventure, strategy and economic genres for a very enjoyable experience. The game loosely follows Frank Herbert's novel, with you placed in the shoes of Paul Artridis and a goal of driving the house Harkonnen from the planet Dune. In the adventure sections, you'll be talking to various characters found in a book, and they will push the plot forward, while providing story background to all the strategy elements that you'll be in charge of. You'll mind spies, wage war, and even work on ecological issues with the Fremen, all to exploit the planet for the priceless spice and to get rid of the Harkonnen. Once said spice starts flowing, since it's also a currency used for all the purchases, the Emperor will begin making demands for regular shipments and you'll have limited time to fulfill them, or otherwise he will invade planet Dune and the game will end abruptly. Dune is neither the best strategy nor the best adventure game really, being extremely linear, to the point of you taking part in most interactions more as a passive witness rather than a person who can actually influence the choices taken. But all those parts put together make for a very atmospheric and fun game. Unlike on the Amiga, on PC both Dune games came out in the same year, so we're having a double feature here. Anyway. While Dune 2 may have not been the very first RTS, it is generally considered to be first modern RTS, and a title that defined most of the staple genre characteristics that we know and see in games even today. Things like gathering and processing of resources, and then use of those resources to build structures and train units, point and click commanding of armies, and the need to protect in gatherers as they're crucial for progress while being fragile and powerless in the same time. And finally the circle of power, meaning that each unit had a weakness that other unit could exploit. So knowledge of the army's composition was a key to success. It's a great and enjoyable title that did not age well sadly. Some design choices are clearly outdated by now, for instance the fact that you can't control more than one unit at a time. Nonetheless, despite my complete indifference towards it, Dune 2 is one of the most important games in history and as such its place in this video is mandatory. BAT2 The Caution Conspiracy is a futuristic point-and-click adventure game with some light role-playing and action elements. You take a role of an agent of a Bureau of Astral Troubleshooters, in short BAT, or BAT, sent off to Roma 2, the most important city on the planet which name I will no doubt butcher now badly, Shedishan, where you're supposed to investigate mysterious and unexplained murder of your fellow agent Sylvia Hatford, who was actually a main protagonist of the first BAT. The game mixes adventuring with bits and bobs taken straight out of other games. So while you work your way on the case in the usual point-and-click 2D style, 
you'll also engage in ship-to-ship -ship 3D combat and can even play games in the arcade. Presentation deserves special recognition as many of the backgrounds are animated featuring characters moving about and just living their lives. It makes the areas you visit feel more natural, more plausible, if you will. B82 is a title that no doubt deserves a whole video of its own. Will it ever get it on this channel though? Honestly, I don't know. When making this DOS-centric gaming history series now, I can compare them to the earlier released Amiga ones. And it's easy to notice that while DOS had many more slow-paced strategy on management games released, well, at least up to 1992, Amiga reigned when it came to platformers, having dozens if not hundreds released by then, usually of very high quality in terms of graphics, sounds and gameplay. PC wasn't as fortunate. But what it did get, especially in the 90s, was largely pretty good. And Titus the Fox is no different. It's an 8-way scrolling, 15-level strong platformer that is said to be 1000 screens big. I mentioned it in the last video and I will repeat myself here, but describing game size in screens is just plain odd. Anyway, you're the titular fox and you have to save your beloved Susie that was kidnapped. Each level consists of multiple objects you can interact with to either progress further or defeat enemies, hidden secret rooms and a boss at the end. Simple as that. Graphics and sound-wise, it's also a very well-crafted title and definitely a platformer PC gamers shouldn't be ashamed of. Armorgeddon is an Amiga original ported to PC and an unusual mixture of strategy and 3D simulation. Your task is to destroy the powerful laser weapon that is to be used to destroy the Earth. So you get to choose up to six different vehicles and then lead them to victory by destroying power lines and eventually the laser beams generator. Throughout the game you pick various targets yourself and then decide if you want the chosen vehicles to attack it on autopilot or would you rather control them yourself. If this description seems a bit vague, then good, cause I'm not gonna lie. I've never played it, even if I had it on both Amiga and PC. I just never got it enough interest to try them out when in the same time I had so many more so much better titles at hand. Was I wrong and did miss something special? I may never know. But perhaps this footage will strike your interest and you can let me know later on in the comments below. I'm not entirely convinced that Stunt Island is a game at all. I mean, sure, there's a stunt competition you can partake in for money, but in reality it's much more than that. It's a stunt flying simulation mixed with a movie maker of sorts. There are over 50 different flying objects available. Yes, objects, cause not oral planes, there's a duck and space shuttle among them to name a few oddities and more than a thousand props. And that's actually where the magic of Stunt Island really lies. You can arrange and fly various tracks and stunts with an unparalleled 3D engine control of viewpoints, camera positions and prop placements, and then save that flight to a file that can be shared and viewed even by those who don't own the game. It's definitely something that was not only uncommon, but entirely unheard of in 1992, and the most interesting feature of this little title. I'm a huge Star Trek fan. I consider its vision of peaceful future, where we're no longer members of individual countries but just earthlings, citizens of utopian vision of our planet, and the founding members of the United Federation of Planets to be very enchanting, and something we in real life as species should strive for. Is this ideal version of us even possible? Hard to tell. In Star Trek's universe it wasn't either, at least not until the first contact with other species, which open our eyes, or their eyes, to the fact that we're not the center of the universe and that there are other, often much more advanced and developed beings. Star Trek is a subject I could talk about for hours, so I'm gonna stop now, before this video becomes something that it wasn't supposed to be at all. So, coming back to the game, Star Trek 25th Anniversary is an adventure game where you play a role of Captain Kirk and along with your crew from original series, you're on an episodic set of missions of diplomacy and exploration. Each episode offers different problems to be solved and throughout the game you'll use skills and abilities of all crew members in different capacity where they fit best. Preferably in Federation's integral goal of avoiding combat and violence as much as possible. So you'll be flying USS Enterprise through the galaxy and controlling different crew members individually during the missions. Star Trek 25th Anniversary is a good adventure game, but not better than the best in the genre. Unless, that is, you're a Star Trek fan, then obviously there isn't much that can hold a candle to it. Castles 2 Siege and Conquest is a perfect example of a follow-up well done. It expanded on everything that made original castles fun in both scale and scope. This time, you're not a noble defending his own territory, but aiming to conquer historical Britain. Castle building from the first game is still here and is largely expanded adding new building parts and soldiers. It is not, however, what will take most of your time. 
as it will also be divided equally between three options – Stock, Army and Relations. Within each you'll spend points on various tasks and you can assign all points to one task to finish it faster or spread them between the few to work on them all at once. And they can be acquiring resources, gold refining, soldier recruitment or diplomatic relations among others. And honestly, it's that last diplomacy bit that's the biggest novelty from the first game and arguably the most interesting part of the new one. As you can spy or sabotage opponents here, cater to Pope's favor and in general play a meta game within the game, which is always fun. Same as in First Castles, you'll also be periodically asked to make a decision out of available few, and it will influence the remainder of the game in varying degrees. Battles have been considerably improved as well, allowing now for a full unit by unit control as opposed to former watch whatever happens and hope for the best approach. Overall, Castles 2 is a much better game, even if castle building itself has been relegated to just one of the many tasks that you'll be working on. If you like strategy games set in medieval times, you'll have a hella good time here. Dark Queen of Crin, same as its predecessors, is a Dragonlance Advanced Dungeons and Dragons RPG and the last part in the Crin trilogy of Goldbox games. It's virtually the same as the other two and a decent conclusion to the long story. If you've played the earlier ones, you'll want to finish the narrative and see how it all ended here. And to be honest, apart from interface being cleaned up, not much has changed from previous outings. For better or worse. It's still same good old RPG with tactical turn-based combat. And a title that's while difficult is also incredibly fun and enjoyable to complete. Megalomania is a real-time strategy, but entirely different than Dune 2. If I was to explain the game to someone who never played it, but has a basic general knowledge of most popular video games, I'd say that it's a real-time equivalent of civilization spread over multiple maps, where each three consecutive maps correspond to one era and conquering them allows for promotion to further ones. With the exception of the last one, where there's only one huge map as opposed to three smaller. The game starts in 9500 BC and ends in 2001 AD, so you'll go through most of our real history. Even though Megalomania is not supposedly set on Earth per se. So yeah, nuclear weaponry. The Patrician is another unquestionable proof that in the 16-bit era, German developers were absolute grandmasters of trading and management games. It's an incredibly deep and well-executed trading game that simulates very complex and dynamic economy, where nearly everything from supply and demand to investments and actions of all players influence it in one way or another. While your ultimate goal is to become the leader of so-called Hanseatic League, I prefer playing Patrician as an open-ended title where you grow your empire and amass wealth. And to do so you have a multitude of available endeavors. You'll obviously be trading using both trading offices and ships. You'll build public works, private houses, industries, and can even pursue a political career. Interaction with pirates and burglars is also not something out of your sphere of interest, if that's what you're after. I wouldn't say that the Patrician was ahead of its time, but it was definitely a representative of the absolute best the times could offer in trading genre, and a title that deservedly so gained huge popularity. Wolfenstein 3D is an episodic first-person shooter and a game that single-handedly kickstarted the FPS genre. Released a year later, Doom launched it to the moon and guaranteed its mainstay in gaming libraries as one of the most important types of games to this day, but that subject is for another video though. The first out of three Wolfenstein's episodes was released completely free as a shareware title published by Apogee and that can be considered as a cornerstone of game's success as many more players got to sample the frantic and fast-shooting bonanza it offered and just couldn't shake the urge to keep going. And the resolution was quite simple, to purchase the game. Each episode has 9 levels, last one always ending with an epic boss fight, and a hidden one somewhere within the first 8. Wolfenstein 3D received additional 3 episodes in a nocturnal mission pack that served as a prequel to the main game story and added more of the same blood pressure raising action packed goodness. The game offers four weapons, knife, pistol, machine gun and gatling gun. Not much for today's standards, but for the first game in a genre, more than enough. And a few additional pickups, medikits, chicken meals, dog food, ammo and treasures for points. If you've never played it, and I doubt that, but if you really didn't, pause this video and go do just that. Bomberman aka Dynablaster is a perfect port of PC Engine's original. And when I say perfect here, I really mean it. The game is amazing and infinitely playable, easily one of the best competitive multiplayer games of the time, especially that even up to 4 players could play on a single system all at once. I don't think there's anyone who haven't heard of Bomberman, but on an odd chance I'll quickly explain. 
I will however talk about multiplayer mode cause despite the game being playable alone too, it was not made for that. In short, it's a game where you're one of the few bombers who are trapped in a maze. That maze is filled with destructible and indestructible bricks and you have to use bombs to open up passages and destroy opponent bombers. Under some of the bricks there are hidden buffs and upgrades and among these you'll find additional bombs, bigger explosions and faster movement, to name a few. It's a frantic and extremely addictive title when played against others, not so much alone. Alone in the Dark is a survival horror with action-adventure elements and a spiritual precursor to Resident Evil games as it was the first ever 3D survival horror. You play as a female or male protagonist and have to escape the haunted mansion you're locked in. You will however get attacked by various ghosts and monsters while going around said mansion and have to either kill or banish them to progress and survive. There are numerous puzzles all throughout the game that require solving, which usually but not always ends up being using appropriate object in a correct place. And since we're on a subject, while you can collect weapons and other items while on your way, you have to carefully manage your weight-based inventory as you can only carry as much. Influences of Edgar Allan Poe and H.P. Lovecraft are quite obvious all throughout the story and keep you on your toes all the way to the playthrough worthy end. Realms of Arcania Blade of Destiny is a full-fledged role-playing and a first title in Realms of Arcania trilogy based on German pen and paper RPG system The Dark Eye. And by full-fledged I mean that it's not just a combat-oriented dungeon crawler as many games of yesteryear were, but a very deep and engaging experience where you have to keep track of many things throughout the game, like separate first and hunger counters for all six of your adventurers. You can also split your group into smaller teams and control them separately if necessary, which often proves quite useful when solving puzzles. Blade of Destiny is played in a typical for the genre first-person view when traversing and switches into top-down to grid-based tactical display for combat encounters, which in fact are surprisingly deep and really fun even if a bit clunky to control. If you enjoy good, big and time-consuming RPGs with huge world and hundreds upon hundreds of items, you've hit a jackpot here, cause Blade of Destiny is definitely a game for you. Moonstone A Hard Day's Night is a game of many genres. It's a multiplayer party real-time role-playing board game with beat-em-up combat sequences. And that's my simplified definition of it at the very least. And I know, I know, it does not sound simple at all. My love for Moonstone is not a secret to any of the long-time subscribers of this channel. I have a whole separate review video covering it and sure it's an older one and a bit rough to watch now but I do talk about Moonstone in more detail there. And even though it covers Amiga version, other than not sounding as good, PC Sport is virtually identical. Anyway, as I was saying, while theoretically you can play Moonstone alone, it is a game designed to be enjoyed with others, preferably by four players all at once. The design goal of it is simple, to find a moonstone and enter Stonehenge at appropriate moon phase to your given moonstone. So in theory a game could be beaten in around an hour, in practice it's highly unlikely. In search for said stone you'll fight your way through various monster layers, battle it out with other players, upgrade your gear in the shops and raise stats via experience points. What moonstone was most famous for though was its gorefield presentation, the game's beyond brutal. After some battles the screen is more red than anything else and for the time there was just nothing like it on the market. But don't let it fool you, it's not a cheap money grab. Moonstone is a really stellar title and an amazing time to be had with a group of friends. While Risky Woods may be best played on the Amiga, with most polished presentation, beautiful background, sound and music, it is still a very good side-scrolling platformer on PC. The game is built out of four worlds, each consisting of two free levels. And it's kinda similar to Rastan, with an exception of starting weapon being throwing knives and not a sword. Defeated enemies drop coins that can be collected to either use to replenish energy or buy better weapons at the shop. When you die, you drop most of your coins, which can be troublesome if you drown. But when you're slain on the ground, some of them stay on it and can be picked up again. A definite highlight of Risky Woods are the sprites, which are unusually big. So a lot of details is kept on both your character and the enemies. And they all look really nice. Even if, generally speaking, presentation has a lot of browns all over. Brown here, brown there, brown everywhere. The Legend of Kyrandia series of adventure games are among the most acclaimed point-and-click titles ever released. This first game is no different. You're Brandon, a grandson of a wise wizard Kalak, who has been turned into stone statue by formerly imprisoned psychotic jester Malcolm. Malcolm set to take over Kyrandia and lay down his revenge and you have to prove yourself to be a hero, stop evil Malcolm and ultimately become the king of the realm. As in most adventure games, you'll encounter many puzzles along the way, some requiring use of items picked up on your travels, others use of magic. 
and even though some of these will be slightly randomized, requiring a little trial and error at times, they won't be overly difficult and won't discourage from completing the game. Legend of Kyrandia is full of quirky humor, interesting characters and tells a captivating story that you will no doubt seek to complete if you only start playing. Especially cause the point and click interface has been simplified to the absolute minimum. Reading of all the buttons with descriptive actions and instead offering a simple click to perform action controls. Getting completely out of the way to immerse the player in this enchanting world as much as possible. B-17 Flying Fortress is a flight combat simulation unlike most. First of all, you're not behind the steering paddle of a nimble and fast fighter, but a huge and heavy legendary World War II bomber B-17. Secondly, you're not alone, as a craft of this size requires a full set of 10 crew members. Each of them described with a set of ratings in piloting, bombing and gunnery, and each assigned to appropriate positions by you. So picking the right people for the job have never been as important as when flying this beast. And last but not least, and that's also something that made B-17 Flying Fortress a game more interesting than most in the genre, is the fact that you can actually take over control of any of the craft stations. So you can mend the guns, or bombing site, or even pilot the plane yourself. And switch between those stations in real time as you see fit. The fact that the game looks pretty good and was very playable was just a cherry on this already sweet sweet cake. All fans of simulations who happened to have an Amiga or PC back then, no doubt know of it, and those who don't would definitely enjoy it, even today, more than three decades later. Ultima Underworld The Stygian Abyss is historically very first ever first person role playing with real full free environments and fluid motion. It was also a first game in the genre to allow for looking up and down, swimming in bodies of water and featured non-linear gameplay. It takes place in the Great Stygian Abyss, a vast cave system containing remnants of old utopian civilization. And you, as usual with the Ultima games, are Avatar, and have to save Baron's kidnapped daughter, who is supposedly held in the dungeon. The dungeon is not only filled with monsters though, so you get to meet many different NPCs with whom we can interact in other ways than combat. And since we've mentioned it, combat is action based. You have to hold the mouse button for basic attacks of various strength, based on how long the button is pressed, and aim those attacks at enemies. If that wasn't enough, there are a few different types of these, different for each weapon, jabs and slashes among others. There's also magic, which is rune based, and an appropriate combination of runes produces a specific magical effect. Personally, I hate rune based spell systems, but if you don't mind, it shouldn't be an issue. Aces of the Pacific covers the conflict between US and Japan during World War II and is a combat flight simulator in which you can side with either of them. You will fly single missions or play in a career mode that spans through multiple major battles of the entire war. And your missions will be quite varied, consisting of air, land and water targets. Aces of the Pacific features over 30 different planes, the amount I've not seen in any other simulation of the era, and on top of that the game offers series of realism options that no other titles of the time even took under consideration. Things like blackouts, weather effects, sunblind spots or even air collisions. There is also an in-game fully featured flight recorder included to record and play back your missions. And while re-watching you can actually jump in or out the cockpit at any given moment. Keeping it all in mind, it is no surprise that Aces of the Pacific was a beloved and acclaimed title at the time. While it could be argued that Comanche Maximum Overkill is not a combat helicopter simulation, but an arcade game because of fast and frantic gameplay, one thing about it is beyond any discussions or doubts. With its Nova Logics voxel engine, it offers unparalleled and most realistically rendered terrain visuals of all games released in 1992 and before. And all that running butter smooth even on a basic 386 system. The titular Comanche helicopter never left the prototype stage in reality, as it was deemed too expensive to be affordable by the US Army. But there, in the game you can fly it in its full arcade glory. And take it to any of the over 20 available scripted campaign missions. While Comanche's graphics were outstanding, sound and music design were adequate at best. It didn't stop thousands of players all over the world, however, from being seduced into game's addictive gameplay loop. Shadowlands is an isometric view role-playing in which you lead a party of four adventurers on a mission split over 16 levels to restore peace to the land. Your party members can be controlled as a group or individually, divided and sent off to perform different tasks in different locations. Characters can be either magicians, warriors, priests or orcs. A rather odd mixture of classes and races, but I suppose it was not something that was standardized in computer games as much as it was in pen and paper titles. 
Heroes are described by four staple characteristics of combat, magic, strength and health. And unlike in most other RPGs of the time, they have to eat and drink or they may die. Which was a nice, even if at times troublesome addition. The most unusual feature of the game though is hidden within its title, Shadowlands. That first part in particular, Shadows. The game uses dynamic and realistic shadowing model where light is obscured by objects and things in shadow, if not lit, are generally not considered visible. Meaning that you'll need to use torches constantly to be able to see indoors and your view distance is only as big as your light source arc is. It added a lot to the atmosphere but also made the game slightly annoying at times. F-15 Strike Eagle 3 is a third and last game in the trilogy of F-15 based flight combat simulations. The titular craft is armed with both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground weapons and is capable of taking multiple types of missions in one of three theaters of operation – Iraq, Panama and Korea. Graphically, Strike Eagle 3 is quite impressive, especially when it comes to your plane, terrain and geography. In fact, most of the in-game locations building landmarks are faithfully represented in size and placement, like the Iraqi Presidential Palace in Baghdad for instance. Sound design is pretty good too, definitely one of the best in the genre for the time with all the beeps, creaks, swooshes and booms sounding the way they should. At least to my untrained ears. But most of all Strike Eagle 3 was praised for its gameplay and cited to be the definitive version out of all three games in the series. Laser Squad originally released in 1988 on ZX Spectrum and C64 and a year later ported to the whole line of other 8 and 16 bit machines. PC being one among them, but years later. It's a turn-based tactics game designed by Julian Golob, who you may know as one of two Golob brothers and a design mastermind responsible for later UFO Enemy Unknown, aka XCOM UFO Defense. Coming back to Laser Squad though, it's a game of five unique missions. Well, seven if you count the expansion pack available only on 8-bit machines. And each of those missions is different in its team, but mechanically works the same. All units in your squad have set number of action points and use them to move, perform various actions and shoot. What's most notable about Laser Squad though is that it introduced a simple morale system. So if one of the units keeps missing shots, getting wounded or witnesses a teammate's death, he can become shaken and panic. While panicking he will run out of your control, which is not something that you want to happen. Laser Squad was a cornerstone on which most other notable future turn-based tactic games were based on, and as a first game in a genre, it's a pretty good one, I might add. Lure of the Temptress is a point-and-click adventure game with few and far in between, but nonetheless still present, arcade battle sequences. But that's not the only unique feature of this title. Arguably, aside from its odd mixture of humor and serious storyline, the most prominent feature is its virtual theater engine, which allowed in-game characters to wander around the game world independently of each other and players' actions, performing their everyday tasks. This made the game world feel more alive, more natural and was used in some other future titles, namely Benefit Steel Sky and first two Broken Sword games. Story-wise, you're Diermot, a peasant and a beater for the King's hunting party, and by a series of unfortunate events that led to King's early demise, you're the only one left to defeat the evil enchantress Selina, the titular temptress. Mega Man 3 is probably the best example of how to botch the license and release mediocre title even though the tech required for an amazing game was readily available. It's an action platformer and a wasted chance. The graphics are beyond terrible, only supporting CGA and EGA when not only most titles on the market by then used VGA, but also games supporting SVGA started popping up here and there. Actually, there's two of these in this very video. If that wasn't enough, the game was not a port of NES title, but original production using novel mechanics of transforming into different types of robots. Which, you know, was not a bad idea at all, but in the same time not something that the potential audience expected from a Mega Man game. Toyota Celica GT Rally, in spite what the developers might have hoped to achieve, is not a simulator. It's a fun arcade racer where you run series of races, each divided into smaller stages on gravel, asphalt and even ice. Each stage is timed and after completing it your time is compared to those of other drivers. You don't have to play it alone and up to four of you can have fun on a single system, racing in turns. Toyota Celica features a co-driver that is feeding you pace notes, letting you know about upcoming corners and such. Unusually for the genre, you can actually adjust and specify what information that he provides mean and how early his warnings should be given. 
The steering is quite odd and I never really got used to it to be honest, especially in the auto centering mode, but since the game is not very difficult it was not an issue that would render it unplayable. Personally I was never a fan of those older 2D first person perspective racers and learned to love them with an inception of 3D gaming, but if you don't mind, Toyota Celica GT Rally is not a game to avoid. Robocop 3 is an entirely different game to the previous two side-scrolling 2D outings, and perhaps it's for the best. It came out a bit before the third movie did, so it's not related to it in any way other than the title. It was famous for being probably the first ever to feature a full 3D cityscape and first-person perspective shooting section entirely driven by mouse controls, which may not have been the most comfortable at the time, but was quite impressive nonetheless, and a control scheme that most first-person shooters on PC use to this very day. Sadly, that's as much as I can tell you, cause other than the fact that it was a modern looking game, I don't know much about it. Just never found it to be entertaining enough to play it more than for just a few minutes. Perhaps it's me, perhaps Robocop 3 is overrated, who knows. To simplify, Caesar is a SimCity game in a less open-ended and more mission-based format with addition of sparse military battles. You're in control of your given province and you have to raise it to the point where you'll get promoted to another one, usually bigger and more challenging. And to do so you have to make sure that your province becomes a prosperous and a happy metropolis. So you'll need to build appropriate and sufficing infrastructure, both industrial and service based, you'll trade with neighboring provinces and battle against enemies, usually invading barbarian hordes. And this is where Caesar offers something that no other game did at the time. You can interlock Caesar with impressions as other game, Cohort 2, and that allows for all battles that happen in game to be controlled by Cohort's engine which gives you incomparably larger scope of control of tactical battles as opposed to just learning the results that the base game displays. Come to think of it, I can't recall any other game that does it even today. Might and Magic 4 Clouds of Xin is another innovative role-playing game on this list. Fourth in a series of 10 games spanning three decades and covering numerous settings and plots, and most of all responsible for inception of the brilliant heroes of Might and Magic. But that's a subject for a later video. Distant lands of Xin are about to fall under control of a villain known as Lord Xin, who had imprisoned a local overseer Crodo in a tower and is unleashing havoc across the lands. You and your band of local adventurers gets involved in the mystery and have to solve it, and, well, as usual, save the proverbial day. World of Might and Magic 4 is huge, even if rather devoid of excessive NPCs. And although it's not my favorite outing in the series, it's an engaging and full of interesting stories game nonetheless. The innovative bit I mentioned initially is that Clouds of Xin is best played when joined with its successor, Dark Side of Xin. Together they form a new behemoth of a game, World of Xin, effectively more than doubling the size of either and more importantly offering much better gaming experience. It not only mixes some of the quests from both, but also offers access to some new areas that, while included in both games, were inaccessible without first being joined into singular title. Powermonger is a real-time strategy built up on the engine used in Populous. The goal of the game is simple, on each map, and there are over 250 of these, you must capture most cities and defeat enemy captains. Captured cities can be used to draft units to armies, and you can have as many armies as you have the captains to lead them. Most unique although often overlooked feature of the Powermonger is the artificial life engine, that simulates life of each and every person on the map, and they go about their daily lives without players' input. So they work, fish, farm, collect wood or make items. A little later Bullfrog released expansion for Powermonger that took place during the First World War and was as well received as the base game. First Samurai is a pretty good early 90s home computer platformer, even if it's a bit odd. It's also one of the very few taking place in feudal Japan, where you have to take on other swordsmen and weird enemies to become the titular First Samurai. Goal of each level is to collect 4 items in a set and then use them to get access to the end of the level boss area and then defeat him. Even if first Samurai's graphics are not the best, they are pretty decent for the time and the mix of regular enemies and mythical creatures is fresh and entertaining. Odd use of unexpected sound clips like Hallelujah feels a bit out of place at times but not to the point of discouraging from playing. It's a very competent action platformer that despite being a bit too difficult is rewarding to progress in and eventually complete. Believe it or not, but Overkill is a vertical scrolling shoot em up with a story. I'm not saying that it's a good story, but it's there, and provides background to all the shooting. Your home planet was destroyed and evil alien race enslaved the neighboring six others. You're out for revenge, but first have to free the six captured planets. The end. I mean, I've seen 80s movies with worse story than that, but this is pretty bad too. 
Anyway, as shooters go, overkill is actually pretty decent and fun, offering many kinds of enemies ability to upgrade weapons and your ship. The fact that the graphics are quite polished even if only in EGA is also a plus. Is overkill the best shoot em up of the early 90s? No, not even close. But it's a damn good one. And if you're hunkering for some shoot em up frenzy, you can't go wrong with this one. What I'm about to say is probably controversial, as this 1992's video has quite a few awesome games like Moonstone, Wolfenstein 3D, Dune 2 or Ultima 7 to name a few. But Darklands is probably the most ambitious and best game that's criminally overlooked and underrated to release that very year. Also probably the most broken one. It is one of the most bug-ridden and terribly programmed games to ever come out. All because the first release had a coding issue in it that could even corrupt system files on users' hard drive. It was obviously fixed with re-release, but bad taste prevailed, it seems, and the game never received recognition it deserved. Darklands takes place in a Roman Holy Empire's territory of medieval Germany, and it's represented in unprecedented detail with over 90 cities, calendar system, currency and even weapon and armor types being historically correct. The character creator is one of the most interesting ones I've seen to date too. After choosing name, gender and your social status, you pick your initial occupation which adds corresponding skill points, but also 5 years to your age. And you can keep adding more careers for as long as you'd like, each adding skill points and years to your character. So it's a balancing game of finding a suitable middle ground between the strength and experience. Additionally, magic is substituted with alchemy and you can brew pretty much any and all potions you'd like, given you're actually proficient enough to do so. Enemies and monsters that you'll face are all based on accurate at the time mythos in the region, so dragons, demons and witches may be something that you'll be facing at some point. Darklands is non-linear and completely open-ended, which is noticeable from the get-go, as your party of four starts in an inn in a randomly chosen city and not a predefined location. And while your main goal theoretically is to defeat demon lord Bahomet and amass a lot of fame, quantified as a number, even after you do so and watch the ending sequence, you can jump straight back in and carry on adventuring, completing quests and collecting experience. Darklands in its current form, patched and fixed, is an amazing experience that all fans of role-playing games should at least give a chance, as it will no doubt surprise them with its death and fun factor. Toasty! 1869 is a 19th century trading and management game for up to 4 players. You start simple with just a bit of money, and you have to find a suitable ship, hire a crew for it, and from then onwards the world is your oyster. You have to purchase goods and find somewhere to sell them at the profit. In time, as you earn more and learn about more exotic and profitable routes, you'll start investing in fleets of ships, you'll create regular trade routes and will expand to become a full-fledged trading company owner. The game is entirely focused on management and economy, rather than the action, so there's no Twitch gaming here. On occasion you'll be interrupted by a random event of bigger or smaller significance that you'll have to react to. If all of this sounds interesting or fun to you, good because it is. But it's not a cakewalk, and it will require careful planning and a keen eye for opportunity. Upon its release, Silmarils, the developer, touted iShare as the new benchmark for RPG. Now, I wouldn't go as far, but it's not entirely inaccurate. The graphics that the game offers both on Amiga and PC are exceptional, utilizing full force of VGA. The game world is vast, and while its large chunk takes place in a dungeon, or a fortress to be more precise, it still manages to be varied, interesting and filled with numerous different enemies. Many of the puzzles have alternate solutions, which increases the replayability factor quite considerably, and every single of the possible party members have their own unique personality and temperament. Your warrior Aramir, and you along with your group of courageous adventurers have to defeat Kroll, an evil sorcerer, and spawn of Morgoth and Morgula, villains from a previous title, Crystals of Arborea. Kroth killed Lord Jarl, a ruler of island of Kendoria, and to defeat him you have to travel through the whole island while meeting and recruiting surviving companions of Jarl along the way. Aisher is a great start to an amazing trilogy, or a second title in Quadrology. Depends how you want to look at it. But most importantly, it's a title, if you have time that is, that's worth revisiting even today. In terms of story design, Captive is probably one of the most unique and ingenious games of the 90s. The main protagonist, named Trill, is judged and found guilty of a crime he did not commit. His punishment? 250 years in space cryogenic prison. 248 years later, he wakes up with amnesia not knowing who or where he is. And since his cell has been long doubling down a storeroom, he found a briefcase computer in it. 
turns out that it can be used to control a group of four droids. From this point onward, he has to use the droids to scoop the vast space looking for himself to finally gain back his freedom. Captive is a sci-fi role-playing with first-person view akin to Dungeon Master, where you lead set four droids. Throughout the game you'll visit many bases, shops, you'll utilize various weapons and devices, all to complete your mission. Captive was infamous for the difficulty level that very quickly ramps up and becomes quite unforgiving. Pushover has it all – graphics, music, sound and, most of all, addictive gameplay. The Quaver's chips product placement is largely irrelevant, as it doesn't affect the gameplay in any way. The idea here is simple – all yellow dominoes have to be knocked over in each level, always ending with a very specific one. And since there are many different kinds of these, each with unique behavior, the gameplay is challenging but incredibly fun not only to play, but also to figure out. Great game and a hidden gem that many don't know about. In the end, even though it may not be as remembered as some other games in the genre are, for me, this, along with One Step Beyond, are a few of the best puzzle games of the early 90s. Alcatraz is an action-adventure title where you're a seal marine sent on a special mission to neutralize Drug Baron who with his army of goons took Alcatraz prison under control. The game is played from two viewpoints. Side-scrolling when outside, where you have to take a stealthy approach while getting into each of three buildings in the game, and first-person view when inside said buildings. To get rid of the drug baron, you have to find incriminating papers in first building, then you need to plant a time bomb in a second one, and finally make the arrest in final third. It may sound simple, but you only have two hours to complete all these objectives, so completing the game on first approach is quite unlikely. Anyway, you're not helpless though, and you've access to a whole assortment of various weapons, from pistols, through machine guns, to flamethrowers and even bombs. Alcatraz features smooth VGA graphics, a nice mixture of stealth and action, and a lot of fun and engaging combat. It's a title that most players looking for fun but not silly action games will not be disappointed with. The Adventures of Robin Hood is a greatly underrated and often overlooked adventure game, which is odd because it's one of the most fun and innovative ones in the genre. The game is shown in an isometric pixel artsy perspective, which gives it somewhat diorama-esque cutesy feel. On top of that, it's not linear at all. You can solve puzzles and pick up small quests in whichever order you like, and not feel as if you're led by a threat to conclusion. The game seems totally open-ended. I mean, in theory, you're supposed to gather up allies, your merry men to be precise, and reclaim your castle from Sheriff of Nottingham. But you neither have to do it straight away, nor in any particular way or order. And if you leave Robin unattended for a little while, he wanders off about his own business. A little disappointment and perhaps the reason why we don't hear more about Adventures of Robin Hood are the clunky controls. But there's something that you can get used to with time and patience. Originally released in 1987 on Atari ST and a year later on the Amiga, Dungeon Master shook the world. It redefined, perfected and standardized the first-person dungeon crawling genre of RPGs. It was the first title to really popularize real-time combat in RPGs using this perspective, and also chose having party members' skills grow and upgrade by using them, rather than basing their effectiveness on abstract experience points and levels. Additionally, Dungeon Master introduced direct object and items manipulation by mouse on main view screen, meaning switches could be used, items picked and dropped, all in the very same window enemies, dungeon and everything else was displayed. Magic was performed using certain combinations of runes, which, while novel, was not really my cup of tea, and if I had to name one thing I didn't like about the game, this would be it. At the beginning of the campaign, player can resurrect up to four great warriors to form a team, and then lead them through the dungeon to recover Grey Lord's fire stuff, that is said to be used to destroy the Scorch in the form of Lord Chaos. Neither Amigas nor DOS ports improved on Atari's original in any meaningful way, but frankly there wasn't much to improve on. Dungeon Master was as good as it could have been in this very first outing. And while other titles may have bettered the formula, there can only be one first, and that it was. Even if technically speaking only on other systems, as DOS release was quite late to the party. Lamborghini American Challenge is Crazy Cars 3 but with split-screen multiplayer option. And yes, it's Lamborghini and not Lamborghini. Anyway, it's an arcade racer where you race around the tracks all over the USA to become the undisputed champion of illegal street racing scene. So you'll be set against a series of increasingly more difficult opponents, you'll be placing bets on races, and money won by those bets you'll invest in upgrading your car. The iconic Lamborghini Diablo. Graphics-wise, the game did not change much from earlier title, but if it had to change at all, it's disputable as it looked good enough already. Sounds are same as before too, 
but the addition of new soundtrack was a welcome, even if not game-changing upgrade. Monkey Island 2 Lechak's Revenge, second outing in Monkey Island series, while perhaps not being as influential as the first title, is still nearly as good and one of the very best point-and-click adventure games ever released. Many things have been improved, from graphics that have a bit more animated movie look to them, to the interface and cinematic feel of the adventure. The traditional for the series swashbuckling comedy atmosphere is omnipresent and will keep you laughing from start to finish. Once again, you're Guybrush Freepwood, who's finally a pirate. Perhaps one that other pirates laugh at, but a pirate nonetheless. And this time you're on a quest to find the Big Whoop, a legendary treasure that's said to be bigger, better, treasurier than all the riches of the richest. Yep, one of these is not a word. Anyway, I'm sure that title gave it away, but once more you'll face Lechak, this time zombified. Monkey Island 2, same as its predecessor, is an experience that all gamers, regardless of what their fave genres are, should dive into at least once, it's worth it. And also a game released a year earlier in 1991 that I criminally forgot about in the last video and will no doubt burn in hell for that. Or rot in the ground. Whichever belief you subscribe more to. First of all, I have to preface it by saying that I love trivia games. I played them back in the day in the 90s, I played them in the 2000s and I played them to this day. I think that they're not only amazing to broaden one's horizons without feeling like studying, but are also fun house party games and work great when having drinks with friends. Anyway, I've played numerous Trivial Pursuit, Wheel of Fortune, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire or Buzz Games. And this, Deluxe Trivial Pursuit from 1992, is easily among the best. Sure, some of the questions are pretty old and regarding subjects we might not be familiar with anymore, or simply outdated by new technologies and scientific discoveries that happened between then and now. But overall, it's a solid package and an amazing time to be had, if you don't mind it being just a series of thousands of questions in various, a little too generalized for my liking categories. Cause that's what all trivia games really are. Just questions. Fox Ranger is a horizontal scrolling shoot em up that puts action ahead of the story. And good, cause we really don't need overly complicated and long backstory to each and every shooter. In Fox Ranger you have 6 levels, each with a boss at the end to beat, and that's what you have to do. Shoot everything that moves, kill the boss, rinse and repeat. No long intros or cutscenes to stop you from having fun here. While disappointing in color availability as they are on EGA, graphics generally speaking are pretty good. The ships are nicely designed and same could be said about the enemies. And there's a lot of them to dispose of, so you won't be bored here. Additionally, Fox Ranger offers two sets of difficulty settings. First, standard for the game in general and amount of your in-game lives depends on it. Second, on which number of shields is based on. Fox Ranger is not the best shooter out there, but it's definitely one that you won't feel like you're wasting time while playing. Birds of Prey is an advanced combat simulator and a port from Amiga. While by 1992 PCs at high end offered a lot more power overhead than Amigas did, PCs version of Birds of Prey is missing Amigas incredible intro. Now I know that the intro does not make the game, but it was so good, I believe it was worth mentioning here. Birds of Prey portrays a fictional conflict between NATO and USSR forces and features 40 different real-life aircraft that were in service back then and 12 mission types. With the last 12 mission type being a test pilot where you test run, or test fly to be precise, prototype craft and they are not part of overall campaign. Each site of the conflict features three land bases and two aircraft carriers, and planes availability depend on the mission and a start location. While Birds of Prey perhaps was not critically acclaimed, I believe that it was underappreciated and overlooked title, and deserved more recognition than it received. That said, I'm not a simulation aficionado and only played them occasionally, so perhaps my sentiment is lost here on those who played simulations exclusively and have more experience in that subject. I believe that Gearworks is one of the most underrated early 90s puzzle games, probably because it looks and sounds well below average for 1992. And since it doesn't look very entertaining judging by the screens only, audiences of the time could have easily disregarded it in favor of more colorful, more easily distinguishable from others' title. It's a mistake though, as Gearworks is actually a pretty good game and a very enjoyable puzzler. Sure, it may not be the most difficult one, at least initially, and quite repeatable at that, but I always thought of it more as a relaxed puzzler. One you can just get into, go through level after level, letting your mind wander rather than flexing all your brain cells all throughout. If you're looking for a bit of r and and just don't dig high-octane action games, Gearworks may actually be something for you. 
Goblins to the Prince Buffoon is a quirky, hilarious point-and-click adventure and a follow-up to Year Prior's Goblins. The Prince has been kidnapped and it's up to Winkle and Fingus to save him. Well, up to you really as you control them, but that's splitting hair. Same as in previous game, the most fun does not come from solving puzzles per se, as much as it does from failing at doing so. Because each action, as physics taught us, causes identical but opposite in direction reaction. Here too, with each wrong choice you take or command you give to your little fellows, game will respond with a unique, fun and entertaining counter animation. To the point that while going through the game and following the plot, even if you figure out how to solve certain puzzles, you'll fail them a couple of times in different ways on purpose, just to see what will happen to the two goblins. Games age differently, but I can say here with full confidence that because of how it's designed, its colorful cartoon-like graphics and tons of fun animations, Goblins 2 is a game that aged like a fine wine. It's as good now as it's always been. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, also known as TMNT, the arcade game, is, well, just that. The arcade game. Or port from the arcades, to be precise. April O'Neil is kidnapped by the Shredder and his two goons, Bebop and Rocksteady, and it's up to you, and preferably a friend, to pick two out of the four turtles, Raphael, Michelangelo, Donatello or Leonardo, and save her. Most of the enemies and villains are well known to Turtles fans and taken directly out of the animated TV series. While the locations may not be as straightforward to recognize as New York, they do have that big city vibe and an occasional broken down iconic yellow cap or sewers kinda suggest that that's where the game takes place. Gameplay is pretty simple with two button controls, one for jumping and the other for the attack. And it's all about defeating a level worth of enemies with a boss or bosses at the end of each stage until the final boss that is, the Shredder. TMNT was very popular on most platforms it was released for, and on most it was actually a pretty good game. Regardless of which I got to play though, I never really understood the appeal. I mean sure the IP is there, but the gameplay compared to other side-scrolling beat'em ups was really nothing to write home about. But perhaps that's an issue on my side. But is it really? Go on, tell me in the comments below. Terminator 2029 is a typical Bethesda game. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's a very playable, decently but not over the top looking and sounding, and ridden with bugs. Granted, none of them are game breaking, but they're there and while we can patch them out in a fraction of a second now, thanks to the internet and everything that's on it, back then patches often meant either complete re-releases of games or additional discs that had to be sent out to players with generated big costs for the developers. So in majority of cases bugs were either ignored or fixed with add-ons slash expansions that were sold and not given away. And that's the case with Terminator 2029. All that aside, it's surprise surprise 2029. You're John Connor and with help of your advanced combat armor fitted with numerous powerful weapons, you're on a mission to destroy the Terminator play. All in a first person crosshair shooter that is pretty fun and engaging. With only downside to it being the way you move, which is step based 90 degrees turning similar to most first person dungeon crawlers of the time. Formula 1 Grand Prix aka World Circuit is one of the best if not the best simulation racer of the early 90s. It features all 16 official international GP circuits and the 18 teams with 35 drivers based on the 1991 season. The names of the drivers are not real though because of the licensing issues but can be edited by hand in game. The fact that you can set up and modify many features of your car to tune its performance along with additional numerous really helpful options makes it a really enjoyable game for all fans of the sport, those more and those less proficient at video games. If that wasn't enough, World Circuit is played in full 3D and features working rearview mirrors, collisions with other cars and debris, crude damage model and different weather conditions that influence how formulas behave on the track. I have a confession. I don't care for F1 as a sport. And to be frank, I don't care about sports in general. They're just not my thing. But despite that, I actually always enjoyed World Circuit, even if I wasn't very good at it. I don't think that 1992 was the best year for this gaming. It wasn't even close, in fact. But it's not a secret that it was one of the better early ones, and some timeless classics did come out in it. Games like Amazing Benchmark for all turn-based strategies, Sid Meier's Civilization, First 3D Survival Horror, Alone in the Dark, Voxel Pioneer Comanche Overkill, one of the most ambitious and innovative RPGs ever, Darklands, or RTS genre started Dune 2, and all that just to name a few. But while there was no doubt that those gamers had nothing to complain about in 1992, the most important change in my eyes was standardization of VGA. No longer games supporting it were few and far between, 
they were de facto a baseline. And EGA or SVGA titles were the ones that were the singular exceptions from that standard. And while some EGA games could really look nice in hands of talented graphic artists, VGA was the now, SVGA was the future, and there was no need anymore to cater to already on its last breath tech of yore. I feel that either 1995 or 1996 may have been the best for those, but I've not prepared lists of games for the next few years yet. So it's just that, a feeling. And we'll know for sure in a few episodes time. If you liked the video, do me a favor and smash those shiny like and subscribe buttons below. Maybe even share if you think that the video is worth it. And if you're feeling like you'd like to change the world for the better, you may want to consider joining my Patreon. All videos are released a day earlier there, and I post multiple updates weekly on what's coming and possible changes to the channel. It would also help me release better content, update my editing rig, or even get a camera. Who knows? For now, however, this is all, so have a good one, and I'll see you next time. Peace.